Having finally been freed of the abusive control of her husband, Philip Duke of Burgundy, Joanna of Castile was now determined to cement her legacy as queen of her lands. But years of propaganda surrounding her mental state and lack of support meant the road ahead was going to be very bumpy indeed, and waiting in the wings to take over and sweep Joanna aside was the one man left who should have been her biggest supporter, her father, King Ferdinand. Joanna immediately attempted to secure herself as the legitimate ruler of Castile in 1506, after her husband's death on the 25th of September, but she was thwarted on several fronts. A regency council was set up by the Archbishop of Toledo, setting himself as the leader and requesting that Ferdinand return to Castile to rule for Joanna. To fight against this, Joanna would have needed allies and money. Instead, she was still isolated from the successful campaigns against her by her father and deceased husband, and the treasury was still as depleted as it had been during her father's reign. The people were also facing famine brought on by poor harvests, as well as plague, and half the population were decimated by these two things. But by the 18th of December, Joanna attempted to assert her authority by cancelling all the grants and offices Philip had rewarded his followers, stating they had all been to the detriment of the state. She tried to gather men around her to form a council, much as her mother had done. She even confronted officials who questioned her rule, demanding nothing less than complete obedience to her leadership. But then, Joanna did something that has become muddied between fact and myth. Just before Christmas, the new queen ordered that Philip's coffin should be taken in a slow and solemn procession to Granada, to lie close to Queen Isabella. This was a political decision on behalf of her son as much as anything. For Philip to lie close to the famed Catholic monarch, it cemented his claim as a Spanish king, which in turn solidified the claim of the young Charles, then just six years old. This was all about enhancing her son's legacy as heir apparent. She set out with the procession, but heavily pregnant, Joanna had to stop in Torquemada in January 1507, giving birth to her final child, Catherine. She then continued on her journey to arrive in Granada as well, as there she would find the grandees of Andalusia who could form her power base, protecting her against her father and the remaining Burgundians from Philip's court, who knew they would not be welcome there. But the whispers of her madness had proved too tantalizing, and rumors grew that in fact, Joanna wanted Philip's coffin to travel with her forever, not to be buried in Granada. Stories sprang up that the Queen opened his coffin and kissed the decaying body of her husband, that no other woman was allowed near him. Joanna became known as a woman who was insane with loss and love, becoming Joanna the Mad on this single decision. But the chronicler Pedro Matia, who was with Joanna on her journey, makes no mention of the coffin opening, and even if it had happened, it could easily have been to simply check the cadaver was still there. Philip's followers had followed through on his wishes that his heart was buried back in Burgundy. Perhaps Joanna simply wanted to check his body hadn't gone with it. And as for no women being allowed near the coffin, that was common practice in monasteries, in which only royal women were permitted to enter. Those around Joanna maintained that she was sane and rational, and therefore it seems likely that the stories of Joanna's gory infatuation with her husband's decaying body are not true at all. But one person the stories benefited was King Ferdinand. His supporters wasted no time in repeating the tales and spreading them, cementing the epithet of Joanna the Mad to all who would listen. Even as Joanna tried to assert herself, however, the plague continued, her council disobeyed her, and her demands to end Philip's grants and orders were simply ignored. As a woman, it was felt Joanna needed help, 
even her strong mother Isabella had required the union with Ferdinand, and with the absence of her husband, that left only her father, who stated in a letter to his daughter Catherine in England that Joanna had written to him repeatedly, begging him to come and help her rule her lands. Answering to the pleas of his beloved daughter, Ferdinand said he was willing to give up his comfort and help her rule. How generous! Joanna, in fact, had never written any such letter to her father. As Ferdinand returned from Aragon, his visit happened to coincide with a relief in both the famine and the plague, leaving everyone to think that his arrival had created stability and calmed the kingdom. A chronicler of the time summed up the prevalent feeling on female rule, stating how Castile had returned to its previous happiness, as even the scriptures noted, Choose a man to govern the republic, and the people will live in peace. Anything Joanna could have done would have been scrutinised deeply, purely on the basis of her sex, whereas Ferdinand was already ahead for being a male ruler with previous experience. Even Ferdinand himself wrote a letter to Catherine, suggesting that he was returning to not only provide help to Joanna's physical body, but also to her real corporate one. On the 30th of July, 1507, Joanna and Ferdinand met at Honios, where Ferdinand made it clear he wanted Joanna to hand over the ruling of Castile to himself. Despite her decisive ruling for the previous 11 months, the events outside of her control and the nature of the patriarchal system she lived within meant Joanna's image was irreversibly tarnished. On the 17th of August, Joanna summoned three members of the Royal Council to inform the grandees, the highest ranking nobles, that her father had returned and that they should go to receive his highness and serve him as they would her person and more. While we cannot know her personal feelings completely as they were never recorded, there is some hint in the fact that she refused to sign the instructions. In this way, she was showing her father a daughter's respect, but as a queen, she was retaining her regal authority for herself. Ferdinand started issuing orders immediately, dismissing Joanna's Flemish servants and installing in her household a retinue of Spanish soldiers and women accountable to him. Joanna was now queen in name only and no longer held the authority of the Crown of Castile. By February 1509, Ferdinand had sent his daughter and his toddler granddaughter Catherine to Tordesia, 15 miles from Valladolid and the seat of power. She was confined in the royal palace there, but she was made to be comfortable. However, it was still a gilded cage. Joanna's other children were being brought up in Burgundy, except for Ferdinand, who went to live with his namesake and grandfather, King Ferdinand. Having her youngest daughter with her meant Joanna and Catherine grew very close, and it was also a hint that she wasn't really considered insane in any way. If she had been, it's highly unlikely little Catherine would have been able to stay with her mother. However, reports sent to Henry VII from Valladolid, from his ambassador to Spain, John Stiles, suggest Joanna was attempting to repeat the behaviours that had once allowed her to return to Burgundy. He stated Joanna was very feeble and had the wisdom of a young child. It turned out he based this opinion on the Queen refusing to eat or drink for two or three days and even refusing to go to Mass. In other words, Joanna was exercising what little control she had over what she could as a form of silent protest against her situation. But when Joanna was 37, in January 1516, her father Ferdinand died. Once again, this should have been a period in Joanna's life where, free of patriarchal control, she was able to become her own woman and rule in her own right. But once again, events took a different turn, and her seven years as a captive in her homeland had also had an effect. When Ferdinand died, 
Joanna's son Charles had just reached the age of majority a year earlier in the Netherlands and now needed to prepare himself to travel to Spain and take up his kingship. He had been brought up to believe his mother was mentally unstable and so he allowed Cardinal Cisneros to maintain Castile until he arrived, also sending ahead his former tutor Adrian of Utrecht who would later become Pope. Joanna's world had become very small indeed. She wasn't allowed the run of the palace in which she was held, but was instead confined to just two rooms, a large chamber that overlooked the river and a smaller one beside it. Occasionally, Joanna was permitted to take prayers with the nuns of St. Clair's at the nearby convent, something that gave her comfort. Ferdinand very rarely visited his daughter but would occasionally send her gifts of jewellery. Joanna's days were spent talking to her daughter Catherine, sleeping, reading and looking out of the window. She kept a library of over a hundred books, most of which were religious. Her father had appointed Mohsen Ferrer as her jailer and it soon became clear he had abused his position. With the knowledge and permission of the king. When Joanna attempted to make some complaint about her surroundings and she was ignored, she would fall back on her tactics of refusing food and drink, even reportedly attacking the women who were sent to look after her. Rumours abounded in the town outside that Ferrer was abusing his prisoner and when Ferdinand died, rumours turned into riotous concern and people turned Ferrer out of the castle bringing in local priests to help heal Joanna. Charles and Cisneros both would not tolerate disturbances in Castile, so the Bishop of Mallorca was sent to find out what had started the event. The report he sent back made for uncomfortable reading, and even the Cardinal, a man not easily moved, was horrified by what he read. Even Ferrer himself in a groveling letter attempting to get his old job back, admitted he had abused the Queen. He stated that when she engaged in her rebellious behaviour, he had her put to the rack. This was more likely that Joanna was beaten rather than placed on the rack, but there is little doubt that the Queen of Castile was physically and emotionally abused, and worse, that it had been done with the full knowledge of King Ferdinand, because Ferrer, a mere servant, would not have dared to lay his hands on a royal person in such a way otherwise. Sadly, upon finding out his mother had been so horrifically ill-treated, Charles did not immediately rush to Spain to save her. Perhaps growing up apart from her in Burgundy, and believing her to be mad anyway, had distanced him more than should have been allowed between a mother and son. Charles instead explained to Cisneros that he was occupied with a lot of other royal business at the time, and instead that the Cardinal should continue to run the show until Charles was able to make his way there at a later date. However, he did decide on the fate of his mother, stating that it was necessary to do so as to the difference of opinions about her care, oddly sidestepping the fact that she may not have been mentally unstable as he had been led to believe. The Cardinal was ordered to continue to keep Joanna well treated, but also still under confinement, guarded away from any possible supporters of her cause. But when Cisneros sent his envoy, Lopez de Ayala, to speak with the King about his mother's health, he was warned off by two of Charles's advisers. He wrote back to the Cardinal that he had felt unsafe speaking to Charles about his mother's health and that he felt he had to hold his tongue. So nothing was mentioned to the new king about the fact his mother was likely not mad at all and she remained a prisoner in her own kingdom. In November 1517, a small retinue arrived at Tordesillas made up of Charles and his elder sister Eleanor, both who had come to visit their mother at long last. The pair knowingly lied to their mother about the true purpose of their visit, claiming they had come to see her only to check on her care, 
and Charles stated that he was there to address any complaints Joanna had about what had happened in her confinement. We don't know what Joanna said that day upon seeing her son for the first time since he was six years old, but she had no idea that her father was dead. Charles wanted to take her crown, at least publicly as a co-regent, but he needed the approval of the Cortes to do so. Many of them distrusted Charles because he was a foreigner to them who didn't even speak Spanish as his main language and came with a retinue of Burgundian advisers. Even other members of the Cortes had their doubts about Joanna's madness. They made it clear how they felt about Charles, referring to him only as Your Highness and reserving Majesty for when they spoke of Joanna. Regardless, no one really considered the idea that Joanna would be able to rule, it would seem, and somehow over the following months, Charles received the authorization required to rule in his mother's stead, as his grandfather had done. Charles's next step, to ensure his mother did not publicly become known and show to the world that she was indeed in full control of her wits, was to pension off the Cardinal's choice of jailer and install his own. He chose the Marquis of Denia and his wife Francisca as the new jailers. They had been loyal servants to Ferdinand and Isabella, and their regime for Joanna was only to become more stifling and restricted, with not even convent visits allowed. As she had never been told about her father's death, she was often coerced to do her jailer's bidding by stating that King Ferdinand had commanded her situation. Denia also wrote to Charles, however, saying how Joanna wished to write to her father about how he should be treating her better, instead of locking her away, and that she wished to have her life outside in the world once more. Yet again, she was ignored. After ten years of incarceration, Denia understood how secret everything surrounding the Queen had to be, and how she could not be allowed outside where the lies about her madness would soon be discovered. Joanna was starting to show signs of paranoia, such as being fearful that her younger son Ferdinand might be given something to kill him. But it's hardly surprising after years of being locked from the outside world with no news from it. She certainly was not, however, the dependent and mentally unstable queen the propaganda made her out to be. Denia prevented nobles from visiting Joanna, claiming illness or distance had stopped them. He fired any of the women who cared for the queen if he deemed them untrustworthy, and did his best to prevent outside news getting in. Oddly, Charles seemed deeply concerned about the fact his younger sister Catherine was also shut up in the place his mother considered herself a prisoner, and ordered at once that she be provided with everything a princess could need. Joanna was fearful of losing her daughter, and once threatened to kill herself when the Infanta was moved for a while elsewhere to gain more experience of life outside. When Catherine did have to leave again years later in 1525 to be married, Joanna would remain in the corridor she last saw her daughter for a whole day, only then returning to her rooms and taking to her bed for two more days, prostrate with grief. While we do not really know whether Charles believed his mother was mad, knew she was actually sane, or convinced himself she was mad, it was convenient for him to keep her locked away. He had female representatives in his stead, such as his aunt Margaret of Austria looking after the Netherlands for him, but none of them held power in their own right. He had given them the positions they held and could take them away. Joanna was different as the true Queen Regent, and if her sanity became known, it was highly probable the Cortes ever disliking of their Burgundian overlord, might support her in taking back governorship of her own kingdom. But in 1520, the revolt of the Comuneros broke out against Charles's rule, led by the leading citizens of Castile, their representatives known as the Comuneros. Their leader, Juan de Padilla, 
was the son of the general captain of Castile under Joanna's mother, Queen Isabella. He led a small delegation to Tordesillas, and while Denia attempted to prevent their entry, they were welcomed in by some of the members of Joanna's household. Padilla showed Joanna all the deference due to a queen, falling to his knees and kissing her hand. He gave her two pieces of news that would likely have sent her head into a spin. The first was that her father, Ferdinand, was dead and had been for the last four years. What Joanna thought when she heard these words is unknown, but it also revealed how Denia had been lying to her for the past few years. Padilla allowed no time for grieving, however, as he then went on to tell her about the dismal state of affairs in Castile and that the citizens wanted to throw off the Habsburg influence under her son's rule. Removing the Burgundian officials Charles had left to rule Castile in his stead as he went to take on the mantle of Holy Roman Emperor after his grandfather's death. Many disliked the excessive taxation Charles enforced on them as well. Importantly, the rebels wanted Joanna to once again take charge and be their queen, ruling Castile as she had been meant to. Padilla reported back that he had conversed at length with Joanna and that she was intelligent and lucid, no sign at all of her supposed insanity. The rebels also threw the Marquis of Denia and his wife out of town, and later when Denia wrote to Joanna, unbelievably asking her to restore his former job as jailer, she quite rightly told him to leave her alone and never speak to her again. She expressed amazement to Padilla about the state of affairs in Castile, having deliberately been politically left in the dark for over a decade, and promised she would remedy the situation. The rebels required her signature on several documents to authorise their actions, but as ever before, Joanna was careful with what she signed. Holding off on giving her signature, Joanna instead stated that she needed independent counsel and requested four specific counsellors be brought to her, one of them the Bishop of Malaga. Charles's supporters, including Adrian of Utrecht, who was now trying to hold Castile for his master, needed Joanna to remain at the centre of a myth about her madness, and the rebels needed her to authorise their actions. For the next 100 days, Joanna listened to representatives who told her of the state of affairs in her kingdom, of the ills people believed had been done to them, and importantly, that she should have confidence in herself and govern her kingdoms. They told of how every citizen in Castile was ready to obey her and die for her. With Joanna restored to her rightful throne, as they told it, all would be well once more. It was a remarkable offer for someone who had been shut away for so many years. Joanna would have the chance of real freedom, of being the queen she should have become, of being respected and listened to. The men before her were respectful and intelligent, asking only for her aid with a simple signature. They would do the rest. And yet, for some reason, Joanna held back. As much as she claimed to be on their side and to want to right the wrongs that had been done to her people, Joanna would find excuses not to sign the documents. Adrian of Utrecht got word to Joanna that if she signed the documents, her son Charles's rule in Castile would be in trouble. Ever mindful of her familial duty to keep the Castilian crown for her own son, and unaware of his true hand in events, Joanna refused to sign, saying that she was ill, all grieving for her father. She asked only to see a few representatives at a time, delaying the talks. Joanna chose her side, and it was the side of her family rather than that of the rebels. Conceding her father had imprisoned her, she said it was down to the influence of his new queen, Germaine. When told of complaints against Adrian of Utrecht, she replied that she had heard he was a good man and it must have been his counsellors that were at fault. When told of how her son was now co-regent, Joanna answered that it was the custom for such a thing to be done 
and that all that belonged to her was his and that he would take good care of it. The reasons behind her decision are pure speculation, but it's possible Joanna thought the Comuneros might use her as her husband and father had, installing her as little more than a puppet ruler. In her moments of paranoia, perhaps Joanna even worried they would simply lock her away again, this time without the protection of family ties. Perhaps she was simply so deeply entrenched in the idea of family and duty that her son's legacy meant more to her than her freedom. Family was all Joanna had left, and after so many years spent in just two rooms, perhaps there was fear about going back into the outside world. Perhaps Joanna simply didn't know how to function outside of her prison anymore. Fortunately for Charles, Joanna's refusal to sign anything paid off for him, and support for the rebels soon started to crumble away when it became clear the Queen would not help them. Charles's victory was final, and the rebels were crushed. Denia was reinstalled as Joanna's jailer, and she went back to her previous regime of refusing to eat or dress, forced to remain in her few rooms once more. Denia complained to Charles of his mother's behaviour, stating how the attention she had received from the rebels had made her haughty and difficult, words often used towards women who demanded their own rights, suggesting that torturing her might help. Thankfully, Charles did not sanction this, although whipping or beating Joanna were never ruled out. Her daughter Catherine wrote to her brother Charles, stating how the Denia's not only treated her mother and herself with far more familiarity than one should treat royalty, but they tried to prevent Catherine from writing letters to friends, stole things from Joanna and pretended they were for Catherine, and also that her mother was now shut in a single room which was only lit by candlelight. As much as Charles seemed to believe he loved his sisters deeply, Catherine's pleas for aid were ignored his trust in the Deniers too much. Nothing changed for Catherine until her marriage, and nothing changed for Joanna at all. As the years wore on, Joanna remained in her captivity, but was visited by her children and grandchildren on several occasions. Her grandson Philip, destined to rule Spain, visited her and brought his first wife to see her. Empress Isabella, her niece and Philip's mother had brought her children to see their confined grandmother when younger. In 1550, two of the Queen's grandchildren came to see her bringing portraits of their own children. Joanna pored over each one asking a hundred questions. Her son Ferdinand sent her a beautiful golden cross that dated from 1451 with a message of love and respect. Joanna was enraptured with the gift. She had not been forgotten by those outside. After all, family remained her focus. And yet, none of her relatives ever suggested she might like to leave the four walls that kept her caged, and they often helped themselves to any of her possessions that they took a liking to. This was little more than taking advantage of a woman in a weakened position who likely would never be able to handle coming out from seclusion again. Joanna came to be paranoid of those around her, sure that the women sent to care for her were there to harm her in some way, or that they were spies or even witches. She would attack them on occasion, not helping the stories of her madness. The Deniers grew bold in their flagrant disregard for her, as Charles maintained them in their position, taking what they liked of Joanna's possessions, and treating her how they wished. It must have been a miserable existence. The one area in which Joanna knew she had some control was with religion. The one thing her jailers and family worried about was her immortal soul, and so often she would refuse to hear mass or give confession. It was Joanna's only form of rebellion. By 1555, the then 75-year-old Joanna was frail and physically weak. After 46 years of being a prisoner, she found it difficult to walk, 
and often went to bed for weeks at a time, too weak to move for her bed sheets to be changed. Her family, fearful for what might happen to Joanna's immortal soul if she died without confession, sent representatives from the church. Finally, she submitted and accepted extreme unction from the Jesuit Francisco de Borgia, although she still didn't make a full Catholic confession. A few days later, on the 12th of April, 1555, Joanna was finally released from her imprisonment in the only way anyone would now allow. She died in her sleep. Throughout Spain, she was visibly mourned, but her relatives were surprisingly quiet in their grief. Alive, Joanna had been an awkward problem for her male relatives. In death, she could be remembered as a queen for her funeral, and then forgotten about. She was buried with all regal honours, taken to the Royal Chapel of Granada, and placed beside her mother and father, her husband Philip, and the tiny coffin of her nephew, Prince Miguel of Portugal. One can only hope she finally rested in peace. It is hard to tell the story of Joanna in an emotionless way, especially as a woman. She was denied her inheritance, her rights, and most importantly, her freedom, on the flimsy basis of her mental capabilities. It is likely that Joanna was politically untrained and unready for the courtly life she was thrust into at Burgundy, but instead of helping her, Philip saw an opportunity to exploit his naive young wife, and so began a lifetime of misery for Joanna. Historians have often viewed Queen Joanna merely through the lens of whether or not she was mad, but evidence shows us much more than that. Joanna, much like her sister Catherine of Aragon, understood her duty both to her family and homeland. And so when she left to become a royal wife, and even when she returned to Spain with Philip by her side to claim her Castilian crown, Joanna never lost sight of this. When confronted with the knowledge that her family had imprisoned her and her son Charles had taken her crown for his own, Joanna calmly accepted this to allow her family, her children, to maintain their dynasty. She would probably have been proud at the way they did so, the descendants of Joanna taking over Europe in a complex family web that lasted for centuries. Joanna was also strong-willed when she had to be, and passionate, as shown by her rebellious behaviour and tempers. She was intelligent and articulate. However, Joanna was not politically astute, and her indecision and hesitation cost her reclaimed freedom on more than one occasion. She was also a victim of controlling and abusive behaviour from male relatives who should have instead cared for her and helped Joanna in her position, but she was too easily manipulated and subdued. Her years of imprisonment eventually left her too afraid to venture out into the outside world when given the chance, and conditioned to what her life had been for decades, Joanna chose incarceration and family over freedom and rule. But the one thing Joanna was almost definitely not is mad. It is highly likely she suffered from depression. It would be surprising if anyone in her position did not. And after her many years locked away, Joanna became paranoid and distrusted many of those around her. Also, understandably, but the evidence shows a lucid and coherent woman in control of her wits, one who was hidden away to maintain the power her ambitious male relatives craved. There is no happy ending to Joanna's story, and knowing the truth behind her imprisonment is horrific. But Joanna kept control over her family's legacy by refusing to sign documents and remaining in her prison, and in doing so, she ensured her family was the ruling elite of Europe for years to come. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.